Good morning. Good morning and greetings to South Carolina companies, and your exporters and trade and business experts. We are delighted that you could take the time uh, to join us today. And uh, a big thank you also to Norris and his team at the South Carolina Department of Commerce for giving us this opportunity to talk to South Carolina companies about effective online business development tools. We hope that uh, you can take the time to, to talk about this today. And just while the last uh, registrants are logging on, let's just introduce ourselves as well. So um, my name is Susanna Hardy, and I am uh, Chief Content Officer at VT uh, Online. And uh, um, so I get involved in everything that involves content, from search engine optimization and to, to, to webinars uh, and, and, and um, online media. And I'm joined today very gratefully. Um, thank you very much, Samantha Sofici, Business Development Manager at IPT Online. And uh, Samantha is a very, very valued and experienced colleague who is um, really terrific at, at, at helping nav companies navigate the online world and their online online tools. And we are absolutely totally delighted to have Norris with us, um, who's the manager of international trade for the South Carolina Department of Commerce. I'm sure Norris is uh, well known to many of you as an active proponent and, and advocate of South Carolina companies and helping them uh, tirelessly to, to, to grow their business and grow their, their, um, their exports and goods. So a brief word also about IBC Online, uh, where we are an independent company, we're a US company, uh, and we've been around for, for, for a while now, since 2002. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we basically are 100% focused on building, hosting, managing online tools for our clients. Uh, um, so I guess really our, our biggest unique selling point is that we work think, act globally and online and have done since our creation back in 2002. So uh, without further ado, today's webinar, we've split it up into sort of these six big categories. Uh, we're gonna get, let, get uh, Norris to talk a little bit first about South Carolina resources that you have at the moment and, um, and what the uh, Department of Commerce is doing. And then we're gonna talk about why we think South Carolina exporters need localized websites what kind of online business development tools there are out there that you'd be taking advantage of, some examples of how exporters use those websites, and then talking a bit about the online global program, uh, which is dedicated to South Carolina uh, companies. We've left some time uh, at the end for, for, for questions, and we would really appreciate your questions. Just pop them into the, into the uh, question box, the, the chat box. We'll be creating them. Uh, getting them, gathering them together, and um, and putting them up uh, at the end. So please do do give us your questions. So let me then turn to Norris to tell us a, a bit about uh, South Carolina and resources for um, uh, for you all now, uh, Norris. Uh, thanks, Susanna. Uh, if you could uh, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, so the South Carolina Department of Commerce, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, is the lead economic development agency in the state of South Carolina. Um, now, I've put on the slide uh, uh, our vision and our mission, and I think that's really important uh, these days during the COVID-19 epidemic that you see this. Um, and really, our job is to create opportunities for businesses so that they can grow, uh, so that they can employ more people, do more sales, uh, and uh, make sure that families have a sustainable income. Uh, and we do that uh, through a variety of, of, of mechanisms. Um, you all know me through the exporting side. Uh, but the, the Department of Commerce is really here uh, for all of your, your business needs. Uh, next slide, Susanna. So the South Carolina Department of Commerce is headquartered in Columbia, the capital of the state, um, but we're, we're also global. Um, there's about 100, 100 employees in Columbia, uh, but the state also has offices in Germany, India, South Korea, Japan, and China. Um, now, these are some of the biggest, uh, the reason we have offices in these countries is that these are some of the big investment investors into the United States, into South Carolina, uh, but we also have a bit a strong exporting connection to these as well. Uh, and so we have some resources uh, in countries that can help you as well, help you too. Um, the Department of Commerce has a, a, a several other divisions, uh, really anything you need uh, related to your business, uh, we are there to help you with. 
Um, I sit in the International Strategy and Trade Division, uh, and trade in this instance really means exporting. And next slide, please. So this is the uh, this is the the big number slide is what I call it. Uh, just to kind of put uh, in perspective, um, South Carolina is a is a small state. Uh, we have five million people. Uh, we're a growing state, however, population wise, but we really hit above our weight when it comes to exports. Um, these are the 2019 numbers. We did 41.5 billion dollars in export sales. We're the number one exporter of completed passenger automobiles and tires um, so we're really an automotive state uh, though we do everything from a to z um, airplanes to uh to zippers um we are, one of my favorite uh qu qu favorite statistics is that we're the number one exporter of kazoos in the united states the musical instrument now they were originally developed in georgia but we now make and export more than any other state um, as i said at the beginning uh, we export above our weight uh, we are the 11th largest exporter uh, out of the 50 states as well. And uh, last year, uh, we increased our export volume by 19%, uh, which is really a, is a big increase uh, year on year. Uh, we're hoping to contribute that, continue that trend uh, in 2020. Next slide, please, Susanna. And so what, do we, what does the Department of Commerce do? Um, a lot of this is virtual right now, as you can imagine, uh, but that doesn't mean we're still not doing all of these items. Um, export counseling. So this is questions, any question you have about exporting, um, you know, if you how to fill out paperwork, what's the market that I need to go to? Um, how do I find my HS code? Um, any, any and everything. Do I have a, uh, I, somebody reached out to me, do I worry about doing business with them? Should I, should I even try? How do I find some background information? Um, we do export training. Um, I consider this webinar an export training session. Uh, you know, what, what tools do you need? How do you actually fill out your paperwork? What is, how is compliance? Um, we're working uh, with some of our other colleagues to um, set up a, a training on the USMCA, which is the US-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, which will replace uh, the NAFTA, um, which is coming into force soon. Um, the state also conducts international trade missions and exhibits at international trade shows. Um, so this is trade missions are when we take a group of companies from the state physically to another country uh, to try to do business. Uh, we help, we work with our partners uh, through the US Commercial Service, often through the embassies uh, to set up uh, appointments, one-on-one -on -one appointments of vetted companies. Um, so you go, you would spend a week in a market uh, doing one-on-one -on -one meetings with a uh, certain number of companies uh, trying to do business that way. Um, international trade shows, some of the larger shows, the state will will have a booth uh, and sublet some of the space out. Um, this is a, a cost-effective way to, um, to get into these larger shows. And we also support companies to go independently as well. And on the last bullet on this slide, the South Carolina Export Incentives Program. Uh, this is a federal and state uh, fund, funded uh, grant program where we provide, provide companies uh, with reimbursable grants to engage in international activities, uh, either to join us on the trade missions or to exhibit some of the trade shows. Um, also under this grant is uh, funding for companies to take advantage of search engine op optimization and localization website online tools. Um, we currently have about three slots available for companies uh, in South Carolina that qualify uh, to take advantage of those services. And we're offering about $3,000 uh, off the cost of those. Um, next slide, please, Susanna. This is the, our calendar, it really should say 2020, 2021. Um, just take this calendar with a grain of salt. Uh, everything's a little bit up in the air, as you can imagine. Um, it starts today with the um, online tools training program that we're doing. Uh, we had we were exhibiting at the Farnborough Air Show. That's been canceled as a result of uh, COVID-19. We still have a trade missions lined up this year to go to Canada, Kenya and Tanzania, Taiwan and Australia, and then early in 2021 to Mexico. Um, these should all be exciting opportunities uh, to meet directly with uh, your business partners. And when we're supporting companies to go to uh, IBEX and METS, which are two marine shows, 
Um, we're supporting companies to join the state at Medica, which is the world's largest uh, medical show as well. And then we're work, we work with companies to, uh, to go to some individual shows themselves. We're always uh, looking forward to hear some feedback from South Carolina companies on where they would like to go, either country or show-wise, and try to figure out a way and build a plan to get them there. Next slide, please, Susanna. And finally, um, this is uh, this is one of my favorite slides. And so this this is really what uh, South Carolina businesses look like in action overseas. Um, we work with companies and encourage them to use online tools uh, to really up their game, make them look sharper. Um, they'll look sharper ahead of a meeting, they'll look sharper after a meeting. Uh, but at the end of the day, we want companies to go overseas, meet their potential partners, meet their potential customers, uh, form a physical relationship as well, uh, and uh, do business that way. And so the South Carolina Department of Commerce is here to help you uh, get there, literally get overseas, do the sales, and what will help you however we can. And I think with that, um, Susanna, uh, I'm transitioning back over to Susanna. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Doris, thank you so much. That's a, that's a terrific roundup, and, and certainly South Carolina does punch above its weight in terms of exports. So we're going to talk now about why we think South Carolina exporters need localized websites. Um, Smith, do you want to you talk us through this? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. So um, we know that unfortunately COVID is a global pandemic, but it's clearly not only a health issue, but one that has affected us, affected us all economically and socially. So for businesses, um, COVID-19 affects all aspects of your business and everyone's business worldwide. So all the decisions at the moment have to be taken with the current environment. Um, and the route out of this for businesses will definitely depend on each company's circumstances, but it's pretty clear that online is key. We all need to try new and innovative online solutions to safeguard our business and get back to level footing and hopefully even maybe some growth. So talking to companies in the US, in Mexico, in the UK, Japan, um, wherever we do business, there are four big issues that we see. So the four of them are looking after employees, uh, managing costs and cash flow, maintaining supply chains and existing partnerships. And then the fourth one, which is the one that we're going to focus on today, is generating sales, exports, and business. Um, do, and we are going to talk about how to do that with online tools because that's where we're experts in. But one of the key messages of this webinar is that it's increasingly important to share good information, which is um, why we were super happy that that Norris decided to partner up with us um, to teach you guys a little bit more about, about the online business environment. So taking a look at the world, the, the online world right now. So as of January 2020, more than four and a half billion people across the globe are on the internet. That's about 60% of the world's population. And it's continuously growing. So last year, about 300 million new users plugged into the internet. Um, and I just want to draw some attention to the average time spent, which is about seven hours a day. And that's an average. I'm trying to find stats for how many hours people have spent since the outbreak. Um, and it's really hard to find hard numbers, but the indication is that the average is about eight and a half hours a day. So it's definitely increasing. So if there's one thing to take away from the slide is that across the globe, your customers, your prospects, your leads, your future distributors, future employees, suppliers, everyone in your, in your business and who your business interacts with is online and they're spending most of their day online. And not only are they online, but they are communicating. And that's, um, and you know, COVID-19 has massively increased that with people working from home, working remotely. Um, it's definitely affected the way that people communicate with each other. So if you take a look at these numbers, it, they are just going to be increasing um, as, as time goes on. And it's not just a national, um, a national phenomenon. This is absolutely global. So out of um, the more than four and a half people, uh, four and a half million people on the globe, you can take a look here at the social media penetration of each of each individual country. And you can see that 
there, it, there are more than 20 countries that are well above the worldwide average of the time spent on social media. And what's important to take take into account there is that these people that are on social media platforms are people that you can communicate with. They're on Facebook, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. Um, these are all your potential customers. So please make sure to take advantage of, of social media as you're looking at international business. And if we take a look at this slide with just the social media behaviors, um, I actually wanted to share a little something that I learned recently from the Financial Times that um, people people are definitely chatting more, socializing more through social media. Um, it's, it's made LinkedIn very relevant. Um, there was, like I mentioned, um, an article that came out in the Financial Times that more people are posting more stuff on LinkedIn. Um, they're sharing that people are posting to stay more relevant to so them when business resumes, they're on the top of people's minds and the numbers absolutely back it up. So LinkedIn shared that the number of conversations between its members jumped 55% in March from the same month last year. And not only that, but the live broadcasts have gone into absolute overdrive. <laughs> Demand has more than tripled since February and the users are much more chatty on these, on these live broadcasts. Um, the number of comments has surged 272%. So people are online, people are communicating, people are chatty. <laughs> and please keep in mind that this isn't just for B2C companies. Um, I know that a lot of companies in South Carolina are in that B2B space. And um, sometimes B2B can suffer a bit from what we call a perfectly engineered syndrome. And this is when you think deep down that your product is so wonderful and that it'll sell itself. And I'm not doubting your product at all, but I, was, I would suggest that the current situation has put an extra damper on that. And um, so you need to be communicating online. You need to be communicating with your customers. Um, and I wanna add that B2B e-commerce is more than three times the size of B2C e-commerce, which is something that we'll cover a little bit later on in the slide. But um, just keep in mind these stats that the people that you're talking to on the other side of that B2B business, they're people too, and they communicate on social media and online just like you do. Samantha, thanks very much for that overview. I'm gonna take over now and, 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 and just continue a little bit about, about some of the things we're seeing uh, from our companies and, and what we're seeing uh, around the world. Mar Norris talked a bit about trade shows that are, that are, you know, a lot of them have been postponed or even canceled. That's for, especially for B2B companies, that's a, a, a big asset and a big resource that B2B companies rely on to find new distributors, to find new clients, even to talk to their existing clients and to launch new products, all of that. Um, so really, that's a, it's an amazing asset which is currently not available to many companies. But we think it's really important to try and mitigate some of the, of the damage uh, that, that, that that causes. And one of the, the main takeaways we have is really to, to make sure that you stay as close as possible uh, to your existing clients and to your good prospects. Lean in, in other words, um, uh, you know, especially in terms of any kind of sales and marketing strategies, you really want to sort of lean in, stay as close as possible and as relevant as possible. One thing we'd also say is make sure that your websites and your social media and your communications are all um, on point about this. That 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 you know your 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 homepage is reflecting the fact that you know you're you can't go to that trade show, but you are still open for business. Uh, equally for your for your social media, you know it's 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 important. And then I would add there is an absolute explosion going on in terms of virtual online trade shows. So you know, stay tuned. There's a lot happening there. Um, I mentioned websites. One of the things we're saying, you know, is basically make sure that your websites, if you're open for business, that your websites say so. Uh, um, especially if, if you have international clients, you know, who if they if they are reaching out to you because they want to do business with you, respond. And perhaps that you can say, well, we are open, although the way we're doing business is a little bit different. Uh, you know, perhaps you need some new calls to action to 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 um, address this issue. Um, make sure also that your distributors are you know are, are are able to project in their own markets. If you're working with international distributors, are they open? Are they able, do they have the tools they need to sell your your products um, and services? So clearly, using your website is 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 a vital importance for that. And I guess our the message that we wanted really to to give with all of this 
is is about being prepared for the rebound. So you know, obviously we we don't we don't have crystal ball. We have no idea when the rebound will be. But you know, things are beginning already to open up. I don't know if it's going to be a double dip, a seesaw, or a vertical line. Who knows? Um, uh, but we can all look around and find some kind of key indicators for ourselves and for our companies that can show us not just the shape of the recovery, the timing, but also where it's likely to be in different places and different geographic zones at different times. So one of the things about online tools is that it allows you to go international faster and to reach international markets faster. So, um, you know, being prepared for the rebound means also using online business development tools like your website, like, like social media, to really reach out and to um, be prepared for that rebound wherever and however uh, shape it takes. I'm just going to share this slide here. This is um, actually taken from one of our clients who's in the aviation sector. And I've talked about sort of key indicators. And one of the things that they watch is just passenger numbers to try and give them an indication of when that might be recovering. And they're looking particularly at China. So the dark red solid line here in this chart represents uh, domestic passenger numbers in China uh, in the aviation market. This is uh, um, sourced by, by um, IATA Economics. And you know, clearly that, that, that line has a steeper gradient than anything they saw in, at SARS in 2003. And equally, actually, over um, from 9-11, uh, a sharper downfall, but also a sharper rise. And again, we don't know if this is going to be a, a seesaw coming up or a double dip, or whatever. But at the moment, that's what it looks like, and that's the kind of indicator that this company is 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 looking at. Um, um, consumer companies, in particular, anything in, in luxury goods, is also watching very carefully what's happening in the beginning markets. And I just want to bring this forward. Hermes, the French luxury goods company, opened up its uh, big flagship store in Guangzhou. Guangzhou is the, the wealthiest province of China. That store collected, raked up $2.7 million worth of sales in one day, in the first day they were opened. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, uh, Insta the equivalent of uh, the Chinese equivalent of Instagram posts on WeChat and Weibo uh, were going absolutely viral as people were saying, look, look, I made it into the store and I'm buying this and I'm buying that and so on. So, you know, uh, uh, again, you need to, you know, we really recommend companies find a leading indicator, find where it is that's going, that's developing, why um, that that is uh, uh, breaking through geographically and in your sector um, as a good lead indicator. So I guess for, for us, what we really, you know, the question we posed at the very beginning, why do South Carolina exporters need localized websites? And for us, I think there's really two reasons. First of all, what Samantha explained, the world is online. And they're online for a long time of their waking day. And this is good news. This is good news for small and mid cap companies. You know exactly where your clients and your prospects uh, and your distributors and your future distributors, you know where they are. They're online. And you know how to reach them through social media. Um, and, and the second reason we think that it's important to have these online tools is that it helps you prepare for that rebound. Uh, you can you can spread eat more easily. You can you can say right there's going to be there's you know recoveries happening and it's recover and it's happening in that market. I need to be there. Um, uh, and you can reach a wider market. You can diversify better. So preparing for the rebound and in in, in the new co in the new new will involve online tools. So for us, uh, uh, it's a terrific opportunity to to really take advantage of those. So before we talk about um, what kind of tools and go into that a little bit more, I'm going to launch a quick poll. I'm going to launch just a quick poll to ask you all about what are your main target international markets? Where where do you intend? What are you, what are your target international markets for the coming for the coming year? Or so are you looking at? And, and by the way, I apologize. I only had a choice of five. I I would have listed many more. But if you'd like to just um, you know, say, you know, are you more interested in, in, in Europe or Latin America? You can click on several. And obviously, India, Middle East, Africa, anywhere else in the world, it's all lumped together in a huge, huge other category. But um, uh, I'm, amazing responses. Thank you very much indeed. 
uh, many of you have responded, um, and there's a, a you know it's a very even split. Um, you know, you're very interested in Canada, that's for sure, and very interested in Europe. Um, very and, and great to see. And some of you as well in Asia Pacific. That's really fantastic. Thank you very much. We will have some more polls later, uh, but thank you for applying to that one. I'm going to close that poll and uh, just go into our third section now uh, of the presentation, which is talking more about the online business development tools as a uh, per se. Um, so just looking at, at some of these now, they're ba basically core, you know, online development tools fall into two categories. They're basically two types of online tools. There's your website, and these can be B2B websites, they can be B2G, you know, business to government. Um, uh, they can be large, small, they can have e-commerce enablement or not. Um, um, they can be uh, vastly complex things with, with um, secure portals and, or else they can be purely informational. There are lots of different types of websites. Consider your website as, as a, a online real estate, an online factory, um, uh, a place where you can show and showcase your goods and services. Your online marketing, and basically there are basically two types. There's either search engine marketing or social media marketing, so SEM, SMM. Um, you know, for search engine optimization is a type of marketing. Social media marketing is what um, uh, Samantha was talking about earlier for social media. And again, these play a part in terms of the communication. And from our point of view, what we like to think about is when we say you can have that South Carolina website which is your dominant website, your, your core. And around that, you have your own social uh, media strategy and uh, um, search engine optimization strategy as well to make sure there's good traffic, good engagement, good conversions for sales. Um, but if you have some strong export markets, markets that you believe you have a strong potential in or existing business in, let's say you have a terrific distributor in France, for example, if that has a good business opportunity, you that market deserves its own website in order for your French clients, your French prospects, your French distributor can use and communicate with and investigate and, and, and engage with. Um, and that French localized website also requires some kind of search engine optimization and social media campaigns to feed it and to communicate with, uh, with, the, uh, with the outside, um, with your prospects and clients. So those are, that's the kind of thing that we like to see across, across uh, when, we, when we build up um, uh, clients, um, company, company strategies for international and for using business online tools. But there's one key factor for all online tools. There's one key characteristic, which is that they are all customer centric searcher centric so your french prospect is going to find you through a french website not through your u.s website uh, or at least the bulk of them are because uh the the way the internet is, is structured because of the way search engines work it always puts the searcher the customer at the center it takes their point of view so you as a company might say, yes, but we have these terrific, uh, terrific uh, engineered products or whatever, or, or you know, we're a, a, a tier two to, to BMW, heavens, you know, we make terrific products. Why don't, why don't more companies come and find us? Um, why doesn't Brazilian companies or Japanese companies find us? Because according to, uh, according to their vision of the internet, your website in the U.S. is not relevant for them. And that's, it, it goes back, as I said, to how, how search engines are, are, um, are structured and how they've structured the internet. And, and Google is the, the world leader with 75% you know, market share, but there are other, other search engines out there, like you know, Baidu for China, for example. Um, and even some social media apps, uh, for example, WhatsApp or, or YouTube is used like a search engine. You know, you can search something on YouTube that becomes YouTube then becomes a search engine. Uh, but it's always, always is customer or searcher centric. So in a sense, you, you know, if you take your South Carolina website and say, well, I want my I want I want more French clients. I know French clients would love my product. 
So I'm going to take my South Carolina website and add some French pages. Google says, no, nope, that's not relevant for someone sitting in France. That might be relevant for French speakers in South Carolina, but it's not relevant for someone sitting in Paris or Montpellier or wherever. It's because search engines are localized. So don't think of Google as one massive huge Google. Google is lots of lots and lots of Googles. Google is 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 190 different Googles. Google France is Google.fr, and people in France will search in French. And Google will say to people, Google will respond and rank the responses, uh, the results of that search according to where those people are and how they're looking, and 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 uh, and, and 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 what websites are most relevant. Let me give you a quick example, just in terms of, of of keywords. For example, keywords are really important. So even if you're using the same language, let's say you in America are targeting someone in the UK, you say, well, at least we're using the same language, right? Well, very often you're not. Uh, you know, the here's an example of the word for car. Now, South Carolina is a major automobile car state. You know, it's it, if you're if if you are targeting people in 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 Mexico and you're using the word coche, only, you know, less than 30% of the people in Mexico are going to type in coche. They're going to, you know, 75% of them are going to type in auto. So if you're using the wrong words, you're not even going to be seen in Mexico. Here's another example. And Samantha and I were thinking, what what is a, a really important example for people in social distancing time when we're all working from home? Well, I do not want my dog barking in the middle of this webinar. So we looked at squeakless dog toys. Samantha sitting in Florida is looking at squeakless dog toys. She gets a whole bunch, of, you know, see it's google.com, you know, it's, it's where she's looking at google.com squeakless dog toys. And she gets some images and then she gets, you know, chewy.com, freedom, freedomfullharness.com, Yahoo, and so on. I'm sitting in the UK, google.co.uk. That's my Google. Google.co.uk is my Google that I use. And I do exactly, you know, same language, same search engine. I do squeakless dog toys. And I get marksandbunnies.co.uk, amazon.co.uk, uh, and so on. So different results. Uh, so if you are, you know, targeting a market, you have to think of what is relevant for that person in that market. Now, there's a, a long list of things that make a website relevant. Here are the 10 top criteria of what makes a, relevant, uh, a website relevant for its market. Note that language is one out of 10 top criteria. Hosted optimally, regulatory requirements, the right content management system, all of those things, the, the right domain name, all of those criteria rank highly with Google or any search engine. So if you don't have the right domain name, you're not hosted locally, you're, you're, you're you know, you, you, all those things, you're, you don't have the right content management system, you will not be, you'll be, you'll be, you know, crossed off the list by the big search engines of the world. So from our point of view, step one is getting yourselves a localized website, which can act as a springboard it's customer centric. So you as exporters are saying, right, my German, my German uh, prospects need a German website. It doesn't have to be a huge website. It doesn't have to be as big as your US website. It doesn't have to have every single bell and whistle, but it has to be a real pearl, it has, as the French would say. It has to be relevant. It has to be right. It has to be correct, hosted properly, digitally compliant in Germany, all of those things in order for your customers, your prospects, your distributors to actually find it of use and relevance in the German market or any other market. So step one, get yourselves a localized website. Um, that way your buyer and your buyer persona and that buyer's journey can actually find you. So let's talk now a little bit more about a buyer persona. Maybe Samantha, let, why don't you tell us about a, a, what is a buyer persona? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So as HubSpot defines it, um, a buyer persona is a semi-fictional representation of your ideal customer based on market research and real data about your existing customers. 
So defining a buyer persona is really important. It allows you to make sure that you're always reaching out to the right person at the right time with the right message, saving yourself and your company a ton of time and resources. But what's important to keep in mind is that you can, and you absolutely should, have a few different buyer personas depending on who your ideal customers are. And it's especially true for international buyer personas because they're more likely to have a different language that they're comfortable with, a different lifestyle, maybe a different age group, and maybe even different buyer habits. But before we get into international buyer personas, I just wanna take, take you to a quick example of a, a domestic buyer persona. Um, here is a great example from Zipcar, and their mission statement even includes exactly who their main buyer persona would be, which is someone who's urban, educated, tech savvy, and environment, environmentally conscious. And you can absolutely see how that message is transferred to their marketing by just looking at their Instagram post that you see here on the right. Um, the picture features uh, two people who are obviously young. Um, they're carrying around plants, so it makes them seem environmentally conscious. Um, if you can look in the background, it's, it is an urban environment. They're not in the middle of a farm. So it absolutely speaks to who their main buyer persona is. And the good news is that for you, it shouldn't be hard to do either um, because you already know who your main attributes of a, of a buyer persona, well, you already know what they are. And, um, but if you don't, a good place to start is to look at your customers. Who are you currently selling to? And then get your marketing and your sales team together and they can find commonalities and they can also take a deeper dive into the data of your websites and your social media to get a really good idea as to who they are and who you're selling to. So now diving into the international buyer persona. Um, especially in the times that we're in today, international buyer personas can differ from your domestic persona. And on this slide, there are a few questions that you, sh you should definitely start asking yourself. Like, are there multiple buyer personas for my export markets? How do they find me? What do they care about? So in this example, we use L'Oreal because they are frequently cited for how absolutely spot on they are with their international marketing. If you look at um, if you look at this picture in the text, it's L'Oreal assuring their U.S. stylists that they're committed to support them while we're socially distancing ourselves. L'Oreal knows that their buyer persona is most likely a small business owner or someone who works for a small business, and they know that the majority of stylists are closed right now. So this this ad, this picture on their website, is reflective of what they know the U.S. views as important right now: support for SMEs. However, in L'Oreal Australia, the message is completely different. There is no mention of COVID-19, of coronavirus, of support for businesses, nothing like that, but instead a focus on climate. And this is probably due to the absolutely horrible fires that Australia suffered just a few months ago. So they understand that that is what matters to their Australian audience right now. And then in the last example of buyer personas, um, L'Oreal Brazil is demonstrating to the Brazilian customers that they're doing their part to help the people by producing hand sanitizer, which is something that they don't typically produce for, for that market. So as you can see, um, each buyer persona is clearly different and their, and their messaging from L'Oreal is absolutely respectful of that. Samantha, terrific. Thank you. I think that was a, a really terrific, uh, succinct um, explanation of a buyer persona, an international buyer persona that you all need for when you're looking at online tools. I wanted to also to show, share this example with you about reactivity and the differences that you can have in markets. Um, this is a screenshot of, of um, some work we're doing with the client, and uh, it's, it's the same client, same product. Uh, and just we just tweaked when sort of localized uh, a, a strategy in the UK and one in Mexico. So we're running something in, in the UK and in Mexico. Same time period, same product, same company. Um, obviously, one's in English, English, one's in Spanish, uh, Mexican Spanish, and so on. But you know, now we were absolutely overjoyed and really proud of ourselves, tapping ourselves on the back that we got nine and a half thousand people. Uh, you know, this this this, this um, uh, post reached nine and a half thousand people in in Great Britain, and that we had over a thousand post clicks, which is whoa, you know, this terrific, blew out of the water in 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 Mexico. Uh, Three hundred and seventy-one thousand uh, reached. 
with over uh, 686 reactions um, compared to the 18 reactions we got in the frosty Brits. So, you know, a very, very different uh, reaction and a very different way that the markets responded to things. And in Mexico, we had people doing ha-has and likes and wows and loving it and sharing it. And, you know, in the UK, you've had just a few little likes, perhaps, that's it. Um, so in terms of the, the engagements, you know, we were, we were intrigued by this big difference. But, you know, and, and, and that shows you also how different markets can be, have different reactions to the, the, same, the same post. But it's worth always looking further down into the numbers. Now, again, uh, this is the same, the same client, same product, uh, but over a, a, a 12 months. Uh, and the blue and red um, columns represent engagement. It represents how many people clicked open on it, uh, and liked it, shared it, said it was fun, all that. And you can see Mexico is just through the roof, especially compared to, to these uh, frosty British people. But the, um, the yellow and green columns are also really important. They show the conversion rates. So that's also what you want to have as a company. You want to know who clicked on the who clicked on the where do I, where can I buy this? Uh, request a quote, um, uh, pricing information, and that sort of thing. So those are the really that's what are called conversion rates. So there's engagement and conversion. And we know, for example, that in Mexico you need that huge level of engagement in order to get that level of conversion. And in the UK you need much less to get that level of conversion. So it's a very different market. So these are just examples to show you when you're doing online marketing, when you're doing online business development tools, it is very much dependent on which on, on, on individual markets. And again, I mean, sort of, you know, some of the things that Samantha put up, again, um, what about your buyer persona? How have they changed? And again, that influences your, uh, your social media uh, uh, strategies. One of the questions we're asked a lot uh, as well is how to prioritize markets. Um, and normally, I mean, most of you will have a clear view in your mind about which markets you want to go into uh, next and which ones are the most uh, uh, visible to you in terms of your prospects. One of the ways we look at it is to, or one of the ways we can look at it is to say, let's look at your US website. And here we've taken an example of a, of a client of ours. Now, you know, 68% of the people going to this U.S. company's U.S. website are from the U.S. So call it, you know, two, you know, two thirds uh, are from the U.S. The remaining sort of 30% are from all over the place: Indonesia, U.K., Japan, Canada, Mexico, Malaysia, everywhere. But um, that 30% are the ones who have gone beyond their beyond their comfort zone you know those people in thailand that one percent there's 2868 uh people who clicked on this u.s website they are doing so from far away they've made a big effort to find this company they're not doing it in thai they're not doing it you know it's, it takes a big effort for them to have reached that u.s website um you know, but it's interesting that they had 7%, you know, nearly 20,000 coming from Mexico. So if we just look at Mexico, we could say, well, you know, does Mexico merit its own website, given, uh, given that there's already 20,000 visits to your US website alone? You know, maybe, in fact, we should think about, you know, these are, these are, these are companies and people in Mexico, who, as I said, have gone beyond their comfort zone. This is not in Mexican Spanish. It's not quoting in pesos. Um, it's it's got American measurements, not 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 Mexican uh, metric. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 really hard for a Mexican to go into a, a U.S. website. Let me put it the other way: If you, as a South Carolina company, engage with a a, a German company, will, how comfortable are you going onto their German website in Germany? How did you even find it? So there you go. That's 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 one thing. And then you could say, all right, maybe Mexico indeed has a case to have its own website. Samantha, one talk us a bit about um, e-commerce. 
Yes, sorry. Um, absolutely. So we can't do a whole webinar about international and online without mentioning e-commerce. Um, so first, first, you have to have a sense for how big it is. Uh, $3.5 trillion globally. And out of a total world population of about seven and a half billion and four and a half people, four and a half billion people are online and 3.4 billion people are shopping online. That means about 45% of the world's population are buying things online. And you already know that the US is a huge e-commerce market, um, but it won't surprise you to see that China is also a powerhouse. Um, but then it's, it's also important to note that the Europe in general is also large. So if you combine it, it's about the same size as the US. And we're still getting um, some data about the effects of e-commerce since COVID-19, but everyone agrees that it has skyrocketed and um, most sectors, especially for online groceries and big generalists are definitely benefiting from, um, from global e-commerce. And so just one more note um, on e-commerce, we can't spend too much time on it. Um, I just wanna emphasize the importance of e-commerce for B2B businesses as well. So many people think of e-commerce as just selling to individual customers sitting on their kitchen table or sitting at their kitchen table rather. Um, and they're surprised at the, at the prevalence and um, how big e-commerce is for B2B trans transactions. It's challenging to get consistent data, um, but by all measurements, it's absolutely huge. By the end of 2018, statistics estimated that global B2B e-commerce is valued at around $10.6 trillion in 2019. And so that's about three and a half times the size of the B2C market. But remember, as I mentioned earlier, um, whether you're B2B or B2C business, you're still communicating with and engaging with a person on the other side. So even if your business model is different, you have to remember that nearly 94% of B2B purchases are researched online before contacting a sales rep. And a solid three quarters of B2B buyers do more than half of their purchases online. So what this means is even if you're a B2B product or service, um, even if it's a high price point and customized and, you'll take, and you take a more consultative sales approach, your website absolutely has to be compelling enough and um, and interesting enough and informative enough to encourage that call to action to convince the customer to request a contact because he's, he or she is already doing their online research. They're already looking at, at competitors. They're already looking at blogs and, um, and other information about your product. And so whether you're selling a product or service through B2C or B2B, um, there's a huge there's a we, ha, we place a huge emphasis on smart website development and strategic online marketing um so just keep that in mind as as we move forward sorry about that susanna just have one more thought. <laughs> sorry Samantha, i moved the slides too bad. <laughs> right well we're going to talk just quickly about uh, how exporters use localized websites to give you some case studies um so you know there's a lot of different reasons why people say i need a new website i need an, an export website whether it's you know the, the main motivator is is to to give your distributors the tools they need, uh, you know brand awareness for example, um, you know whatever it is. Very often it also comes down to control. I want to control my online presence abroad and internationally. I I don't want it just reflected on on on, on distributor sites and so on. So um, there's a lot of different ways uh, that are, and motivations for it. Um, we want to to highlight sort of three three companies or a couple of companies just to show you a sort of different different um, uh, examples. So uh, this is a US company, they make paper cutters. <laughs> so not high tech, um, uh, but they've been around for a long time, 100 year old company. Um, uh, and they have a lot of different verticals. They could have you know, uh, from, from school teachers to arts and craft stores, to big retailers, to hospitals, uh, florists, whatever. One of the main problems they had was one, there's no brand, oh, they have two big problems. One, there's no brand awareness in this market. And two, they have no visibility as they sold through distributors, they have no visibility on their end clients. So what we did was to build a series of websites for them in their key markets. And uh, that allowed them then to organize their distributors in a different way, have visibility on their end clients as well and allowed them to slowly build up brand awareness that you know and, and establish themselves as a the brand sort of like the 
you know, the Hoover of vacuum cleaners, um, the sort of, um, well, the, it's now become the Bullmans of the paper cutters in the retail sector. Um, again, if you if you if you're interested in that, uh, there's uh, videos on our on our website uh, from the the CEO of the company talking about it. Um, another another example this time in the avionics sector, uh, avionics support group ASG uh, uh, sells very very high tech um, products. They have very active and energetic sales reps uh, um, in, in in markets like you know Brazil and UAE and China and things like that, big avionics uh, markets. Uh, and their sales reps could be you know incredibly enthusiastic, but they're not always technically able to explain everything to the end clients. And uh, so one of the ones that, one of the things they, that this website had to do was actually have all the information on it and the imagery that was correct on it. Um, so that was really important. I think one of the main things as well that allowed this company to have a very quick return on investment was that com companies in places like Brazil, China, UAE, um, um, you know, China, for example, said, you know, I can see that having made the effort of actually having a really good website in my language, in my country, and so on. I can see that you care about us. You understand us. You care enough about us to actually have a website. Good. So again, if you wanted to have uh, more information, you can go onto our website and there's a video from uh, Hugo explaining that. The third example I want to give is uh, from a company called Amsoil. They are much more B2C. Their problem is to drive traffic. It's, well, I guess it's really two things. One, again, it's brand awareness and driving traffic to their distributors. So they have distributors everywhere in the world, and they want to make sure that those distributors are fed leads. So they have a series of websites, each one very brand aware, very on trend. You know, it's very clearly the same company, but it's specific to that market and that look and feel. For example, you know, if you're if if you're in if you're in Brazil, then you want to have, have something like a like a Jeep. And if you're in France, then you want to have a slick French car. So there you go. Some examples of um, of uh, websites uh, that uh, that companies are using for their different strategies and different motivations, from brand awareness to lead generation across different markets. We're going to talk very quickly also about the South Carolina Online Global Programs. Samantha, how about how about you you do this you do this one? Yep, happy to. Thank so you. our first option is option A which is a two market expansion with a limited scope. So 12 web pages and 2000 words for each website. By the end of option A, you'll have two websites completely localized for your top two target markets. So for this example, you have one in German for Germany and one in French for France. These websites will be based off of your US site, but we will go through a whole localization process, including proper domain names, local hosting, um, SEO keyword research, industry-specific translators, regulatory compliance, and so, so much more. So by having these websites, they'll help you be found, be understood, and be easier to do business with in your top, top target markets. In terms of budget, um, option A costs $12,000, but there are grants available upon SDDOC approval. And um, if you want to learn more about option A, we do have the, the statement of work um, and budget information on our website. So for option B, option B is anything above and beyond the scope of work of option A. So maybe your company is looking for a website redesign, or maybe you want to add international e-commerce, or maybe you only want one country, but a huge scope of work beyond the 12 pages and 2,000 words of like 50 pages and 30,000 words then option B would best um, would be best for your goals. The budget for option B is completely dependent on the scope of work, um, and that's determined by a fact finder between the company and, and our team. Um, but there are grants available as, as they are for option A. And then the last option is um, the last service that IBT Online specializes in, which is international online marketing. Um, if you need help in this area, um, we have a ton of free resources on our on our website of of infographics and um, blogs blogs about social media. Um, so please take a look there. But 
If our free resources aren't enough, we have a dedicated technical team that will be able to help you grow internationally through um, monthly ongoing support of search engine marketing, social media marketing, and reporting and analytics. And um, it is important to note also that in this webinar, we do have a few handouts um, for some of the, the um, countries that Norris talked about in the beginning. I think we have Canada, Mexico, and Australia. Um, and the handouts for this for this webinar, so make sure to check those out too. And those are free downloads. Samantha, thank you so much. Indeed, we do have those handouts, and those are the countries that uh, Norris was highlighting earlier: Canada, Mexico, Australia, New Zealand. Um, Samantha, I'm also going to launch another quick poll, if that's okay. Just to ask whether uh, if anyone has an interest in uh, the online global programs. Um, uh, and I've highlighted A and B, but you know, if any of the any of the programs to get in touch with us, if you have um, an interest in exploring those uh, for getting localized websites for your key export markets, then you can please let us know, uh, and we'd be very happy to uh, to to get a hold of you and 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 talk through the possibilities uh, for that. Uh, thank you very much for those responses, and uh, indeed we will be in touch. Um, um, thank you very much about that. We'll, we'll, we'll be able to get a hold of you uh, for that. Thanks for those responses. Right, I'm going to close that poll. Uh, and, and just because I do want to leave a few minutes for, for questions, we wanted also just to sort of, you know, say really, you know, look after yourselves, look after your loved ones, look after your communities. It's difficult times. Uh, starting feels like it's starting to emerge as the summer comes up. But uh, uh, we still need a lot of, uh, I think we still need a lot of care and to take care and be kind to each other. Um, finally, just a few takeaways uh, and, and then we're gonna have some questions. I guess for us, there are two takeaways, if you like, from this. The first is that, especially now in, in these times of social distancing or, time or uncertainty as well, it's really important to communicate with your clients and with your prospects. And the best way to do that is to use online tools, social media, uh, online marketing, localized websites. That's what creates the relationship which is so necessary for the buyer's journey and your buyer's persona. The second takeaway is that we believe that your first step should be a localized website and that this is good news because the world is online and you need to join that in order to prepare for the rebound from our point of view. Uh, as I said, we have no idea how that rebound is gonna be or when, but we're sure that it will happen and that online tools will be increasingly vital for uh, connecting businesses and doing business. My very last poll, and I promise, my very last poll. Can you please let us know if you have any interest in learning more about South Carolina programs and grants for exporters from Norris or from us, from localized websites, from online international marketing? And if you do, uh, just click the, the buttons and we will uh, let you know if you have any interest in, in uh, that. And um, uh, good to see that uh, there is indeed a lot of demand for, for more knowledge uh, from, from Norris and from ourselves. Um, thank you all very, very much. And we have a tiny, tiny, tiny window of opportunity for questions. Um, so questions, um, there have been quite a few. One of my colleagues also has been curating them uh, uh, for that. And uh, Norris, one of the very first ones um, that uh, I'm at, that I'm being asked is, how do you apply for the grants? <laughs> uh, Norris, perhaps you'd like to respond to that one in a in a very quick. How do you respond to those grants? How do you apply? Or where do you apply? I guess. How do you apply? Where do you apply for the grants? Yes, sure, Suzanne. It's it's really simple. Um, the first thing you should do. Uh, my email is on the uh, website on the on the page. Uh, just shoot me an email. I'm happy to send you over an application. It's also on our website, sccommerce.com. Um, if, 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 you, if, you, if you email me, I'm happy to give you a call. Uh, we can discuss it and kind of let you know uh, what the next steps are and what, uh, how, uh, how, how easy it is to, to actually get one. 
Thank you. Um, and another one here for you, for you, Norris. Um, is this are the grants limited in time, and how do you allocate them? Is it first come first serve basis? Uh, yes. So it is first come first serve basis. Um, we uh, we uh, there's a the full part is there's an application you fill it out and it's a competitive process. Um, we do have some funding available. Um, we're trying to get some out now. Um, so there there is funding available, but uh, yes, first come first serve. Okay. And is it out, is it limited in time? I guess you know. Does it, does it, is the other question I have? Yes. Yeah, so, um, Really, the, the way our, our our grants work is they're um, they're reimbursable, so you have to go ahead. You have to have paid for the service to be reimbursed. Um, and so we're on a fiscal uh, federal fiscal year, which um, ends in um, at the end of September. Um, but it's also depending on when the uh, grant monies uh, run out. Okay, um, Samantha, how about one for you? Which is uh, I have problems buying URLs. Uh, in some countries, can IBT help? Yes, absolutely. So if you decide to do a program with us, um, part of the process is our team getting together with you and understanding what the best route to purchase the domain names, um, what the best route is. And um, it's just important to note also that we don't own any domain names. Uh, we want the company to own them. Okay, thank you. Um, Samantha, also, once the sites go live, who looks after the sites? Another good question. Yeah, so um, we will manage the websites. So we will make sure that, they're, that they stay up and running, that there aren't any bugs, that there aren't any security issues. That's all part of our website management program. But the company itself will have access. Uh, we'll train them and, have, and they'll have access to the website. So if they have, if they want to add a product page, change a picture, add a video, whatever their hearts desire, um, they'll have the ability to uh, the ability to do so themselves. Terrific, and and it's worth saying that that's included in the in the twelve thousand price for the two websites uh, for the first year. Um, we have slightly overrun. I'm, I apologize. I do see that there are more questions. I, I see also the one from Texas and Bordeaux question. We will. What we they're very specific. We will answer by email because I, I do believe we've run out of time. We want to thank Norris and his whole team at the South Carolina Department of Commerce. Um, uh, and, and I want also to thank my colleague, Samantha, for, for joining in and participating today. And uh, most of all, thank you, all of you for attending. We really appreciate that you took the time and, uh, and engaged with us today. And we hope we was of use and, um, and we hope to see you all soon, um, online or offline. <laughs> Um, but um, happy exporting, happy trading, and uh, stay safe, stay safe. Thank you very much for attending our webinar. Bye-bye.